So is that kind of how you came to this concept of the bro code? Like, where did you kind of define it? Was it you had this idea going in or it really kind of emerged out of your interviews? I, I just wanted to give a name to the pattern I was seeing. And, um, you know, as a woman in patriarchy, I do see sexism everywhere. And um, but I, there's a particular flavor of sexism in tech that mm -hmm. I think is unique. And it's um, there's certain performances and norms um, that are right and good and the, and the good, the right way to, to practice computer science. And that is not very good for um, people who have, have been historically disenfranchised from the field. So example, from one example is I started seeing patterns where combativeness was equated with competency. And if you were combative in a meeting, if you used what one, mm -hmm. um, one uh, research participant called precision questioning to drill down on someone's idea, rather than trying to think through it or brainstorm together, just really challenging people all the time. Another participant called her team meetings war, war room meetings and people would just yell at mm -hmm. each other, just the norm. And so that's not great for anybody, but it's particularly um, disproportionately affects people who are already facing other types of microaggressions and unexamined biases and discrimination. So it puts people at risk for not being retained in those fields. If um, these, this precision and aggression and this love of machines to the, the machine mm. itself is fetishized in a way rather than seeing computing as a way that has a lot of different social aspects to it. You know, that the machine itself and tinkering with it is considered competency as well. And there is, a, there is this like tight um, imbrication of a, a marriage, if it were, between technology and masculinity that I think anybody trying to divorce those two things are seen as a threat to the field itself. You know, in the book, you have five different types of bro code enforcers or, you know, d different archetypes of people that will kind of reinforce and perpetuate this kind of culture. Mm -hmm. Maybe can you just talk a little bit about each of those gatekeepers, how to recognize them, how they operate and kind of how to like shut that down? Yes, yes, yes. I'm very familiar with these five characters. I already mentioned the high priests of, of, high t of tech. Um, they feel that calling and they feel that calling then leads them to believe that they have like this illusion of grandeur. Um, yeah. So they, 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 I think that status is really important in the high priest of tech kind of in, um, like this is real computer science. This is not real computer science. And they're always okay. the boundaries of what counts. And so that's what the high priest does. Um, I have the ladder kicker, which is mm -hmm. women who ascend to leadership positions in tech they kind of implicitly know that um, they're a token and that the patriarchal relations of power in the organizations allows for token leadership of women. But if it, again, if there's a critical mass of women leaders, it's gonna shift the entire workplace culture and dynamic and the, the, the ladder kicker knows that. So she gets to a position of power and she kicks the ladder out from behind her and she privileges men in evaluation settings and also, you know, um, looks down upon other women because she wants to be the woman. Um, there's the obstructionist. So the, the person at the meeting who's always, as I, I kind of quoted my uh, research participant, Diane, she, they're always like drilling down on people's ideas rather than trying to embrace them or explore them together. So the obstructionist is, is the one who does all that precision questioning. And, um, and it's um, a lot of my, the word weary kept coming up over mm -hmm over and over again, especially okay. mid to senior women level of a career. And I think that obstructionist is making women weary. Yeah. The creep. Um, so I tell a few stories of, of creeps, the, like men being naked in the, in the office, mm -hmm. calling their secretary at home to, to delight her with that um, information. Um, there, a lot of, I, I was grossly hit on even just doing research and a lot of young women were telling me horrible stories about undergrad and graduate. Um, so it's basically, it. Let me allow, let me just define sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is like a umbrella term and there's two types of sexual harassment. There's sexual harassment, which is like quid pro quo for sexual favors and there's gender harassment, which is behaviors and language and um, values that make women and non-binary practitioners not feel welcome. So the creep is the sexual harasser. You know, there's a sexual element to it. Then there's the troglodyte, which is the person who does gender harassment. They're, um, they're, they have reactionary politics about what gender 
mm-hmm. in what men and women's roles are in society and they and they enforce that and they also believe too the troglodyte also believes that the social side of computing like you know user uh human computer interaction or user interface is the softer side or one male mm-hmm. calls it the veneer of science any type of qualitative social science so the troglodyte's enforcing not just gender roles um, through gender harassment but also um, that ha- having that like rep- being repelled by social science it's not technical enough mm. it's not machine oriented um, so yeah the ladder kicker the obstructionist the creep the troglodyte and the high priest of the five um, folks to watch out for their patterns and I yeah. recommend in my book if you ex- experience interactions with one of these folks send yourself an email it may be useful to have that documentation later on <laughs> 